Thank you. So I represent adult family homes. We're 2,500 strong in Washington State. The average adult family home employs on average six people. So that can be a 15,000 person workforce. Most adult family home owners um, are expanding and right now there's big expansions going on. So I'm looking in the industry for people that want to be general managers, want to be providers, resident managers, uh, people that might be interested in accounting, marketing. There's just a lot of demand that we have in our industry. The pay can range, of course, from $12 up to $25 and more, depending on what you want to provide. A lot of my, the individuals I work with, I really encourage my clients to expand adult family homes, but then maybe open assisted living, home care agencies, other things that we can do to kind of service the vulnerable adult industry to just because it's just growing so fast. So in adult family homes, we take care of people that have very complex medical care needs. Maybe you're interested in taking care of somebody that is on a ventilator. Maybe you're interested in taking care of clients that are have addictions and now they've broken their addictions and they're wanting to integrate back into you know living back on their own so there's a lot of opportunities depending on what it is that is your passion and what you're looking for we're looking for cnas we can take um, nars as well and a lot of my clients will train you and get you all the certificates that you need to try to help you successfully become a partner with their business uh, one thing I would say, it's very casual, so when you are looking for a job, adult family homes are really bad about advertising, but if you live somewhere, anywhere, we all live somewhere, I'm sure around you, you can find about 25 to 30 adult family homes, probably within blocks of where you live, and they're very flexible, so a lot of the homes that I work with, we can work with people that are in college or you need night shifts or I only need four hours a day or three hours or can I come in the morning? So with that, it's very nice. Uh, one, when I had my adult family home, I had a gal that came early in the morning and late at night. She needed a split shift so she could take care of her loved one during the day. So it's a very flexible thing when it comes to work. <laughs> Um, and it's also very much driven for somebody that's entrepreneurial minded that might want to have your own business at some point. When it comes to coming to an interview to an adult family home, bring your credentials, your certificates. I look at hundreds of files and that's what I'm needing. I need to see what I need to get you for more education so we can kind of get you started right away. I want to touch on backgrounds. I find that people don't apply to adult family homes because they're fearful of their backgrounds. Perhaps you have a theft for, perhaps you have an assault for, perhaps you have a low level crime. That does not exclude you from working in the adult family home industry. You're forgiven after so many years on an assault for, it's normally two years, drug charges as well. So yes, we have to talk about it, but if you talk to us about it, then I have lovely, wonderful people that work in the industry that maybe would not have come had I not kind of said, hey, you don't need to worry, we're not gonna judge you. So we're very open in that area to try to get people back to work because I think sometimes that's the one thing that stops people is they think, oh, you take care of elderly, I might have this thing from 20 years ago that'll keep me from working. So if anybody's in that scenario, please, my card's here. I'm, I'm more than willing to help anyone try to get into the industry and, and get working. Because I know it's hard when you don't have something on your resume. So that's kind of my spiel. So I just wanted to say anyone that's really interested in coming on board, looking at different opportunities. You know, I have clients from Bellingham all the way to Olympia and Eastern Washington. There's a place for everybody. There is, you know, no matter your passion, there's something that you could provide our industry in the adult family home world. So please come and take my card, and I would really love any of you if you want an opportunity. And so I'm with CHC Services. I do get a lot of phone calls from CHC, <laughs> um, and we send them right back. Um, and so what we do, we do home health and home care, and what sets us apart, a lot of companies out here 
do either or. They don't do both. And we do it both really well. And what's nice is a doctor can send us an order for a client needing a CNA and needing a physical therapist and needing an RN. And we can take care of them all under one roof. So that's what sets us apart. Um, we've been in business over 10 years. And um, like I said, the home care side is really, we're hiring the NARS and the CNAs. And then the home health side, we're hiring the PTs, RNs, and OT. Um, what also sets us apart is it's one-on-one -on -one care. So if you want to just take care of one person in their home, um, home care would, would be where you'd want to go. Um, we're locally owned and operated, so we're not a franchise, and that has a lot of benefits for employees and for patients themselves. We're doctor owned and operated. That is pretty huge to me that we have a doctor that works at Providence Hospital, another one at Northwest Hospital, and so they're overseeing our operations. Um, we're joint commission accredited. Um, that's what a lot of hospitals uh, strive to be. And because we're owned and operated by doctors, we've chosen to take this extra accreditation. And it just, again, sets us apart from other home care companies that we have standards like hospitals. We actually had the state come visit us yesterday. That was nerve wracking. And because we're joint commission accredited, half the whole interview process was omitted because they said the, the joint commission has higher standards in the state. So that was pretty incredible for us. Um, we provide care management services, so we have RNs that actually can help clients set their pills, take them to doctor's appointments, so it's a real help to the caregivers. Um, and then we also have an RN on call 24-7 for our staff, so that you're never left alone and you have the help you need. We're big on education. We um, will pay you more if you get nurse delegated. Um, I don't know if Angela's talked much about that piece yet, but basically under an RN license, we can have you delegated to do certain tasks, um, one of them. My favorite one's the bowel program. Everyone likes that one? No? Okay. Um, we have feeding too. We do insulin, wound care. So there's just things you can do under the nurse's license. Um, you do have to take a delegation course, which is about eight hours, and then uh, you can do these things. Um, and then we also have a spinal cord injury class that we pay for you to take, and then you can take care of quadriplegic clients. And so we're all about education. Once you've done the delegation, once you've done spinal cord injuries, we can pay you more. There's different levels. And um, the other part that's really nice, we're, we're located here in Edmond, but we have clients all over Seattle. And a lot of people like working with us because of the variety of clients that we have. We have um, this one caregiver of mine loves it. One day a week she works with a quadriplegic client, two days a week with a pediatric <coughs> client, and then she also has you know, two days a week with an elderly client that has dementia. So she really gets a variety of clients to take care of. And so I'll give you some, uh, some tips for interviewing. That's uh, kind of my background. That, um, so the first part of the interview, you send in your resume. We call you in for an interview. We do a 50-question quiz for CNA. And um, George back there, he's our director of sales and marketing. He took it without any CNA experience and got an A on it. So, so no one can be scared of it. A lot of people come in and they're like, 50 questions? But I bet you all could probably pass it. Um, and so you take that and then there's the whole process of um, the interview. And so I'll give you those kind of tips. So things that we're looking for in the interview is that you, your commitment to safety is really important, that you're trustworthy, that you're result oriented, accountability, and that you'll be respectful with the client. And so we're asking questions and we're pulling that out of you. And so some of the other things we're looking for is how you dress. So a lot of people come in jeans and we don't have you wear jeans. We have you dressed with nice, nice pants and nice top because we want you to come across looking very professional. We don't even have you wear scrubs because um, you're in their home. A lot of people, like if you were going to take care of my grandma, she wants you to look like her family, her friends. She doesn't want you looking like the caregiver that they hired. She doesn't want anyone to know she's sick. So that's why we have you come in regular, you know, nice pants, nice top. So if you come in the interview in jeans, you know, it just looks very casual and um, and even, you know, if you're you know, applying for a job where you really do wear jeans, you, you should always dress up. Um, you want to look nice for the interview. Um, you want to make sure you're on time. So if you show up late to an interview, I know for a fact you're going to show up late to the client's home. And I've had people come in a half hour late and I'm like, I'm sorry, I, I can't interview you. And, you know, they're really upset. I'm like, I promise you, if you showed up late here, you're showing up late to my client's home. Um, having your phone off. I've had people answer their phone in the interview and they don't get hired. So that's kind of a no-brainer, right? Um, what else? If you're yawning in the interview, that, you know, I guess I bored you, so you'll, you know, you might be boring to my client, so I probably won't hire you. Um, and the other way that Alyssa mentioned is documents. 
bringing like your whole portfolio of you know your license, your CPR card, TB test, all that is only going to make me more interested in hiring you because trying to collect all those documents from employees is really difficult. So if you show up in the interview with everything, I know that I'm not going to have trouble with you. Um, and then we also do an eight-hour paid orientation, and we've heard that we're the best kind of in town. Um, because you walk away and you actually learn things. We also go over policies and procedures. We do skills verification. Um, and then once we, you're hired and we assign you to a case, there's a lot of communication and a lot of flexibility. Um, if you're a student, you, you just communicate with us. I can only work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We're going to work around your schedule because we have all different types of shifts. Um, and then um, we have a plan of care that we'll give you, and that goes over basically everything you need to know about taking care of a client and it helps you to succeed. So you would follow that. And um, benefits, so we have a 401k plan, and our pay ranges anywhere from 13.75 to 18 an hour, and it depends on your qualification, it depends on if you're going into a facility, if you're going into a home. Um, we also do tuition reimbursement, and we have a lot of room for advancement. I have a position I created that's an admin assistant that also is a CNA, and so I've taken people out in the field that are CNAs that are incredible and they now work full time in the office and have full benefits um, and they get to still do caregiving work in the field and then they get to work in the office. Um, so it's kind of win-win for everybody. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the type of sh different shifts that we have. We have some that are hourly, so someone that you know, has kids and just wants to work you know, while their kids are in school. We also have like 12 hour day shifts and night shifts. We have live-in. So a live-in is where you pack up your bed, all your clothes, and you move into the client's home. Who wants to do that? No one? Okay, so live-in is you're just there for 24 hours at a time. Um, and some people really like it because you get paid, you know, for 24 hours, and a lot of people just do like three days in a row or two days in a row, and you're, you're done for the week, and you just go enjoy the rest of it. Um, we have ones where you transport clients to doctor's appointments, and we have ones where the client wants to go to France, and then you take you all expenses paid for the week. Sign me up, right? <laughs> um, so, and then um, the other thing we're really big on are compliments, and so anyone like gift cards? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A couple people? Yeah. So, yeah. All right, so I'm going to, I noticed two ladies over here that are dressed really professional for this for today, so thank you for dressing night. Nice. Uh, so we're big on compliments. If you, um, the clients or family members have something great to say about you, we're gonna send you these gift cards. We also, you can be an employee of the month, employee of the year, and it comes with um, monetary gifts, and so that's about us. So if you're interested in joining a home care company, that call or come by and visit me, and hope to see, talk to everyone after. My name is Justin. I'm the executive director at Sunrise of Linwood, um, which is really close to here. It's actually in Edmonds, so it's right next to the hospital because there was already a Sunrise at Edmonds, and so they couldn't have two, right? So they named my community Sunrise of Linwood. Um, and so like um, Angela said, there is Stephen back here that's an executive director at Sunrise of Edmonds as well. And so I want to commend you for wanting to join the healthcare industry because it is a hard job. Um, once you get in there, you will be working with people that need your help. And for eight hours or whatever your shift may be, maybe for 24 hours, it's give, 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 and give. And it's a very difficult job. And even if you don't like the blood or the needles, you can still be in the healthcare industry. And that's like me. I just want to start with a quick story. So when I was in the eighth grade, I was like, I love to serve people. I want to be an EMT. I want to be the one that drives the ambulances, right? So I went on a job shadow, and it was so boring. The only thing that happened was somebody hit a telephone pole, and he broke his collarbone. No blood, no needles, and I passed out. And they, they had to treat me more than the guy that broke his collarbone, right? And so if I can be in the healthcare industry, so can you. It takes a whole team to take care of seniors, kids, whoever you're taking care of. And so you make a difference, which is really neat in the healthcare industry. Sunrise Senior Living is the second biggest senior living company in the United States. They're headquartered out of Virginia. And so they started back in Virginia in 1981 and then moved across the West. And so there's six Sunrise um, Assisted Livings and Memory Cares in Seattle. And it's a great company to work for. Um, they are a, a private company, so it is not a nonprofit. Um, but they live by principles of service. 
And that's really who we're looking for. And you're here today because you want to serve. And that's one thing that um, one thing that I I hope you take out of this in my presentation is be yourself. Come into the healthcare industry and be yourself because that's who we need. We need just you. We need people that want to serve, that care about the residents, that care about people. Um, and assisted living, to talk a little bit about the assisted living environment, it's, it's a home-like atmosphere. So we have the great company CHC Services that goes into people's homes. Well, some people are able to stay in the home, and so they come to like, a, they go to a nursing home, and the assisted living industry really came about because they said, yeah, a nursing home is good, but not everybody needs that, that really set care, um, kind of the, the, the warehouse type of feel. And so the assisted living movement said, let's try to make it home-like, where they bring their furniture, family and friends can come in, they can have their own parties, their own birthday parties, but let's provide support. And so with that, we have CNAs, we have LPNs, we have RNs, cooks, dishwashers, activities. We have a whole bunch of team members. And each Sunrise has about, on average here in Washington, anywhere between 50 to 100 team members that are at the community working part-time and full-time, really there to support our residents. Um, the pay. Pay's tough in Seattle right now, right? Because Seattle just bumped everything up. So everybody's really just trying to catch up. With Sunrise right now, we just we said, you know what, let's start at 15. And so if you have a license, like a CNA, it's going to be higher than 15. So the dishwashers, the dining room care managers, housekeepers are going to get 15, and then obviously it goes up based upon your license. Um, and the hiring process, because it is a big company, there's an amazing website that you would go to. You could just search Google Sunrise Senior Living Jobs, um, and you could go through the hiring process online, and it will come directly to the community that you apply for. And one of my managers, whatever job you apply for, will contact you. You'll come in and we'll do an interview. A lot of times we like to do a group interview. And the group interview process is we have a couple applicants come in and you're just meeting with maybe the business office coordinator, the executive director, and they just want to see how you interact with people. Because that's what you're going to be doing with the job is interacting with the team and also interacting with residents. And, and then from there, there's the background check and the drug testing and so forth. So usually it takes about a week and a half to get somebody started. Um, if you're interested in working in assisted living, definitely reach out to myself or Stephen. Um, it's a very rewarding job. The residents that are there, they need our help. And it's amazing what di uh, di the difference that we can make. Um, as far as the work clinic in general, a lot of you are probably familiar with us already. We are a a large medical group in primarily Snohomish County, but getting into King County now as well. Um, we have about 26 locations, um, all throughout as far north as Stanwood and as far south as Shoreline, and then out to like Lake Stevens and Snohomish on the east side. Um, so probably anywhere you live, we have something relatively close by. Um, most of our locations have primary care. Almost all of them have primary care, so internal medicine, family practice, pediatrics. And we also have walk-in clinics, urgent care at most of our locations. And then we have over 40 specialties as well. So those are primarily concentrated at our main office in Everett, but then many of our satellite offices have a handful of different specialty departments as well. So if there's any particular area of healthcare that you are interested in, we probably have that specialty. So lots of opportunities to specialize in certain areas um, or be in primary care or urgent care where you get to see a little bit of everything. Uh, so kind of just a, a normal clinical department type environment where, where you would come in and come in for your doctor's appointment. Um, so along with that, we have a lot of different types of positions. Uh, medical assistance is generally our highest population at the clinic. We have more MAs at the Everett Clinic than any other type of employee, and so we always, always, always have MA openings, uh, especially as we've been growing and opening new locations that always creates additional MA openings on top of that. Um, and so lots of openings for MAs. Uh, our other positions that are, come up really often are phlebotomist positions, uh, medical receptionist positions, nursing kind of covers all of those locations as well. We don't have as many nurses as we have MAs, but, but still a fairly high volume of nurses. Uh, and then, of course, all of our provider positions as well, whether it's mid-level providers like PAs or ARNPs, and then all the way up to our positions. And so a little bit of everything, lots of opportunities. Um, to start wherever you're at, and then a lot of folks choose to grow um, within those positions and, and move forward into other areas over time. 
Um, or some folks just find their niche and say, hey, I really love being an MA or I really love being a phlebotomist and I'm going to stay in that role uh, for a long time, which is great as well. Um, as far as pay for some of those positions, um, we kind of have a, a pay range for every type of position and where we place folks within each range is primarily based on the length of relevant experience that someone has prior to coming to us. Um, so as far as just kind of new graduate looking for your first type of um, position, um, pay for MAs we're usually looking in the low 19s as far as an hourly rate, uh, phlebotomists usually in the mid to upper 15s as far as the starting rate, uh, reception so if you have no um, no specific credentials, but still want to get your foot in the door in healthcare reception positions are a great way to do that. Those start generally around $15 an hour, 15 to 16. Uh, and then, of course, additional education creates different opportunities for additional pay from there, depending on um, what schooling you have, what certifications you have, and things like that. And as far as benefits, a lot of kind of the, the normal ticket items that, that you see and are looking for, uh, medical, dental, and vision insurance is available for everybody that is working at least 30 hours a week. 30 hours and above is what we consider full-time for benefit eligibility. Um, we have different plan options that staff can choose there. Um, we have a wellness program where you can log exercise and eating choices and things like that online and earn different incentives for participating in that program, which is pretty cool. Uh, 401k is available in terms of retirement savings, and the clinic has a matching contribution to that. Um, paid time off, holiday pay, different things there, of course. Uh, and we have a tuition reimbursement program also. If you are um, hired into a certain type of position, but you want to continue your education and move forward in other areas, we have opportunities for that. We'll reimburse up to $2,500 a year for any full-time employees, uh, and up to $1,250 a year for part-time employees. And just as our way of promoting career development and helping people grow in advance. Um, for those that want to do that. Um, as far as our process, um, similar to what Justin was saying, we have an online application process where um, you can go to everclinic.com, click on our jobs page, and, and can find all of the openings that we have. Um, now that we are a part of the larger DeVita Medical Group network, you do have to filter by Washington to get to the Everett Clinic positions, and so that can be a little bit confusing for some people. So I can kind of get that message out there so that you can find our positions and not wonder why there are positions in other states that confuse you. Um, and then once you have applied, we have we don't do any sort of electronic screening of your resume, so every application is actually seen by a recruiter, either myself or um, my coworker, whose name is also Amanda. She does kind of my counterpart. She does a lot of the positions that I do not do. Um, so one of the Amandas will see your information. Um, we manually screen every application, and so um, that just creates a, a larger possibility of you being able to come in and interview with us. Um, from there, I'm always looking on the Department of Health website to see who has licenses and who's ready to go and things like that. Um, and then a, an in-person HR interview is kind of the first entry point um, where you're coming in and it's really starting the process from there. Um, from there, next step in the process for medical assistants specifically is we do an online MA assessment. That's something that's unique for MA positions only. We don't do that for other areas. Um, and have a medical assistant assessment. From there, you move forward to an in-person interview with one of our hiring managers, depending on what department you applied in. So if you applied for Snohomish Family Practice, then you would meet with the leadership at the Snohomish site, that kind of thing. Um, and then from there, we check references. And so always kind of be having that in mind, especially as you're in school or if you're going through any of your externships, things like that. Be building your repertoire of who you can list as your own. So we're going to want to talk to those people because um, they know you better than we can get to know you in a 45-minute interview sitting at the desk. And so we want to be able to talk to those people and, and get some information from them. Uh, and then once we have references completed and have kind of gone through all the steps leading up to that, then at that point we're able to make final decisions and communicate that information out. So a lot of times it's just a little bit of a, a puzzle to, to work on together. A lot of times I meet with a candidate and I really want to hire you. Um, but we just don't have the right opening right now. And so we keep kind of talking about, hey, what about this department or this department? Because uh, I'm using MAs as our example. Some MA positions are a lot more hands-on with a lot of procedures and things like that. Some are a lot more administrative where you might spend more time on the phone or at, at a computer or working on paperwork. And so I was kind of trying to get a feel for what are you interested in? What do you want to do? Is there a specialty that you're interested in? Uh, to really find that good person job fit where you find a job that you are going to be able to be successful in, but then also a job where you're going to enjoy it because you're going to be more successful in your job um, and be a better caregiver for our patients if you like being there. Uh, so sometimes it's just that process of working together and figuring out what that looks like.
looks like for each um, different candidate coming through. Um, as far as some kind of resume interview application process tips for me, um, one big thing is to just make sure you're including your legal name on your application. If you go by a, a nickname or if you go by your middle name, that's fine. You can note that on there as well. Um, but I'm using your name from your application or your name from your resume to type into the Department of Health website to see if you have a license. And if I can't find you on there, I'm probably not going to bring you in for an interview. Um, so list your name on there and better yet, put your credential number on there because then it's that much easier to find to guarantee that, yes, you do have a license, we know you're qualified, uh, and can kind of start the process for there. Uh, also include your externship on your resume. I'm surprised at the amount of times where that doesn't happen. Uh, but if you are a brand new graduate coming out of school looking for a first position, your externship is your primary healthcare experience that you've had so far. So list where you did that, um, because that helps give a little bit of a basis for what, what type of experience you've had up until this point. Uh, as far as interviewing, uh, we do behavioral-based interviewing, which I'm sure a lot of these organizations do as well, where instead of asking um, questions to uh, describe yourself and things like that, we want to know what have you actually done in a specific situation. Um, because it's, we can all talk all day long about ideally what we would like to do or what we think we would do in a situation, but I want to know what you've actually done when you've been faced with either a change in the work environment. How did you show your ability to be flexible and adaptable to that? Or what was the time where you had an idea of how to do something better and implement a new process? And, and how did you handle that? And different things like that, um, where there are a lot of questions starting with, tell me about a time when blank this happened. Um, so be thinking about that, especially during your externships. What type of experiences do you have? What are some times where you felt like this was a really successful um, outcome that I had, and this is a good a good story that represents me as an employee and me as a teammate and me as a caregiver. And have some of those stories kind of in the back of your mind that you can use to answer some of those questions because that helps get help up, helps us get a feel for what what do you do actually when you're on the floor with our patient. Um, and then along with what others have said, dress professionally um, to an interview. Don't wear jeans. It's just not a good idea. If you don't have professional clothes because it's not something that you really have needed for work in the past, dress, come in scrubs. You'll be wearing scrubs at work, so it's perfectly fine to interview in scrubs. Uh, I have a lot of folks email me ahead of time and ask if that's okay, and it, it is okay. That's what your normal work attire will be, so it's no problem interviewing that way. Um, as far as just a couple other tidbits, be responsive in communication. A lot of times I have long lapses of time before I hear back from people, and that's generally not my, my preference. Um, so being able to be responsive on emails if I have questions for you or I'm following up, inviting you back for a second interview, things like that, I make sure that you're being um, on top of that and being responsive and being available. Um, any types of the requirements like our MA assessment that I mentioned or submitting your reference information, be timely in getting that done. Follow up with your references to make sure that they respond to us. We have a hard time sometimes hearing back from references because you put the ball in someone else's court and then it's not as important to them that you get the job and so then they don't call us back. So make sure you're kind of bird dogging that, following up with your references, making sure they respond. Um, just helping the process move along smoothly so that not too much time goes by. Uh, a couple things that we are, are looking for. Um, I always am, kind of want the balance between your hard skills and your soft skills, if, if that makes sense, and if that's something you talked about in, in school, where we want you to be able to do the technical things that are required in your job and be well-trained and competent and um, all of those things that help make our care safe for our patients. Uh, but then also having that, that soft skill side of things where you're friendly and you're personable and you're professional and you're someone that our patients like to interact with. Because if you have all of one of those things but not the other one, it's not going to work very well. If you're all in the, the details and the, the routine and the, the technical aspects, but you don't have people skills, that's not going to go over very well with our patients. But if you're all hearts and stars and rainbows and don't have the um, focus on safe patient care, then that is not going to apply either. And so having kind of those two pieces that balance each other out, um, teamwork's really important, initiative is really important, being someone who's accountable too. Um, be trusted in your job and to take care of what needs to be done without someone looking over your shoulder, all those kinds of things. Um, as far as growth opportunities for us, we talked a little bit about how you can use tuition reimbursement, go back to school, grow on the clinical side of things. Um, there's also lots of opportunities to grow 
on the leadership track as well. I'm using MA as an example. Again, you can move from an MA position to an MA lead position, then supervisory or management positions from there. And um, so kind of those are our two main tracks for being able to grow uh, within the department. So can you give me a little bit of background about CHC, where you are not the same as Janelle. People get Linnell and Janelle and CHC as confused all the time. So, uh, But to give you a little bit of our background, so our mission uh, is to provide our device, diverse community with access to high quality, affordable primary health care. Um, and the reason I mention that to you is because the patients we serve here in Snohomish County um, are often those who may not have a roof over their head. Um, they're in the poverty level many times. Um, they have addictions. Um, not all do, but many of them do. Uh, there may be personality disorders, drug addictions, alcohol, you name it, our patients may have it. I'm running out of breath, so I'm so excited to talk to you. Um, <laughs> we provide um, medical, dental, pharmacy services, behavioral health, psychiatric care um, to um, young adults, um, those who are homeless, those who are not, um, as well as adults and also children. Um, we were originally founded in 1983 as a referral service, and we found that there's such a great need for healthcare that we opened up our first clinic in Everett. Um, and we have five clinics now, ranging all the way from down here at Edmonds, all the way up to Arlington, and we're opening up two more clinics in Everett. One's actually gonna be at um, Everett College, Community College. Cool. Yeah, we're excited, this is gonna be a learning clinic. Um, so we'll have our MA externs actually um, sourced from Everett Community College, as well as our existing clinic, um, schools that we source from. Um, let's see. A little bit more about our clinics. Um, although we only have five clinics, we see generally about 200,000 patients in any given year. Um, and this year we're actually aiming for about 230,000 patients. So that's quite a bit for five clinics. That's why we're expanding. Um, like I mentioned, our patients are um, in the poverty level mostly. 89% um, of our patients participate in Medicaid. 7% um, of our patients are uninsured and 40% are under the age of 20. One third of our patients actually speak a language other than English. So we actually offer a language incentive for those who speak a second language. Um, it's an additional 75 cents per hour for that second language you speak. Um, I currently support all of the roles that are on the line staff. So our medical assistants, our dental assistants, um, medical reception, dental reception, um, call center, <coughs> excuse me, um, we also have housekeeping services, um, patient billing, patient call center. Um, so you can work in our call center and service is a little similar to reception, but they also take um, really basic in inquiries about medical and dental um, services. Um, our interview process, so we um, have our managers actually support the whole interview process. So they screen all of their applicants that come in. Um, they will do, then do a phone screen with you. And during that phone screen, they'll determine if they feel like you're a great fit. Um, for their team. They will then bring you in, and because the mission um, is so important to us, we'll then do a cultural interview and see if you're a good fit for the culture and see where your heart is, what kind of work you actually want to do. Once we complete the cultural at that same time, we'll then do an in-person interview, and that usually includes the supervisors within the, um, within the clinic as well. Let's see, what else are we looking for? Um, as far as our benefits go, so CHC does um, provide free medical, dental, and vision insurance for the, all of their employees. You then only pay for coverage for your um, spouses or any other um, children that want your insurance. Um, we also have home ownership programs, health savings accounts, um, 403B, which is similar to a 401K. Um, we also have tuition assistance, um, employee assistance programs, and we really um, value getting education for our employees. Uh, so we will support you if you come in a housekeeping role, for example. We've had people then go into medical assisting or even the RN programs. Um, let's see, what else? Helpful hints. Amanda covered everything I was going to talk about. <laughs> so um, similar roles. Um, but again, I can't stress enough for CHC being a nonprofit how important the mission is for us. Um, if you have a heart to help those in need, um, or you've been there yourself and you want to give back to the community, CHC is really the place for you to come. Um, when you come for an interview, really speak to not only your skills, the your hard skills, what you learned in school, but what your soft skills are. Like I said, we have a really tough patient population sometimes. Um, so that ability to de-escalate and get that patient the services that they need um, are going to be the most important for us. Um, let's see. Dress um, and demeanor. 
Um, we're fine with you showing up in scratch with like Amanda mentioned, that's what you're gonna be wearing at the clinic. If you're gonna be one of the administrative roles, you really wanna be dressed in a business professional um, outfit. And um, Virginia Mason is a, a health system that's, uh, we have a flagship hospital in downtown Seattle and a medical center uh, set of buildings there and we also have seven other regional medical centers across the Puget Sound. Um, the ones that are most north are the one in Kirkland. So across the health system, we employ people um, in all different types of healthcare roles, ranging from our inpatient setting where we have nurses, PCTs, CNAs, um, to our lab, our pharmacy areas. Um, we have a call center as well where we have um, team members, we call them clinic service representatives or patient access specialists that are answering phones. In our regional medical centers, um, they're primarily outpatient. Uh, we have um, medical assistants, registered nurses, um, phlebotomists, medical lab. We also have in Glenwood and a few other regional medical centers an ambulatory surgical center where we're doing um, more procedural work. So there are uh, some scrub tech positions and things like that um, in some of our regional medical centers. But um, across the system as a whole, we have about 5,000 people that we employ, and every medical center um, ranges between 100 and 300 people in, in every location. Um, what I think is unique about Virginia Mason is uh, I think three things. The first is that we have a strategic plan, which is, a, it's a visual, it's a pyramid, and at the very top of the pyramid is our patient. And um, you can ask any single employee uh, anywhere in our health system and they will tell you who's at the top is our patient. And so um, it's really neat to be a part of an organization where everybody is driven by the same uh, goal of, of serving our patients and helping to improve their health and well-being. Um, at the bottom of that strategic plan pyramid, um, we have something called the Virginia Mason Production System, which is our way of making improvements and doing our work. We call it our management method. But essentially, um, back in the early 2000s, our executive team went over to Toyota in Japan and learned how they manufacture cars. And they came back to um, our health system and they applied what they learned to healthcare um, and developed their own way of making improvements. And essentially what that means is that every single team member has tools to make improvements to their work. And um, the expectation is no matter what your role is, um, whether you're the executive or you're the front desk team member or somewhere in between, that um, you are looking for ways to improve your work and you're um, leading change and, and you're being a part of um, making improvements so that we can do the very best for our patients. So I think that's really, really neat. Also, in the middle of our pyramid, it's all about our people. And so our people are our most important asset in, in helping to um, drive value and, and great care for our patients. And so we um, really focus on a culture of respect that's really important to us. Um, we have every team member goes through a training called Respect for People. Um, and we have 10 behaviors that we look for and we um, look to recognize in each other. Um, so that's also, um, I think, just unique factors about Virginia Mason that really make me do this work. So um, our recruitment process is pretty similar to what everybody else has kind of shared. Um, I think our best source of information is our website where you can go and look to see what um, options, what positions are available, and you can search by location if you're interested in a specific area or in a specific position. In terms of advice for you during the interview process, I think a lot of people touched on what are some tips when you're interviewing, but I'd also like to throw out there, you're asking questions um, of the people that are interviewing you. Uh, your engagement in the organization and um, in the culture is just as important as what we're looking for in candidates. And so I think really making sure you're asking questions about, you know, what are, how do, how does the, um, what, what's the feel for the workplace and how do they solve problems and, um, what roles can you take, informal roles can you take to be a leader in, in your work setting? Um, so I think just understanding how you can contribute in ways outside of your job, um, that's just as important as all the questions you might ask about the specific role that you're applying for. So um, I'm around for more questions. Thanks. So I'm a service alternative, and we work with adults with developmental disabilities. So primarily people with intellectual disabilities and autism. We work with some people who have cerebral palsy, um, Down syndrome. We also have started working with people with some mental health issues, so um, mostly um, intellectual disabilities and people with autism. And what we do is we go into their homes and we help them out. So think of everything that you have done for yourself today that someone with a significant disability would need help with. There's a little bit of caregiving involved. There's a lot of teaching. 
We do a lot of positive behavior support. And it's, it's kind of a, when I say positive behavior support, it's probably a term that you're going, what is that? Um, positive behavior support really is, it really impacts someone with a developmental disability who has behavioral issues. And, and, you're, and when you really want to make a difference in someone's life, you work really hard on the positive behavior support. It's teaching people to get their needs met more effectively than acting out. Um, so it's, it's, it's amazing what positive behavior support will do. Um, we help people go out in the community. Um, we go to baseball games. We help people go to Disneyland and spring training. And I have been everywhere. I've been with Service Alternatives for 23 years. Wow. I know. <laughs> when, I, when I started, they said, well, you're, you're young and you're nice and you're pretty. And they say, well, you're still nice. <laughs> oh, I think it's funny. Um, and I remember my start day. I started July 5th. I uh, was it 1994? Someone do the math for me. Mm -hmm. um, That's good enough, yeah. Mary. Close, close enough. <laughs> so, yeah. And and I worked hands-on direct support for seven years, and then I moved into recruiting. And I love doing recruiting because I'm kind of nosy, and I like people. So if you if you have come to apply with service alternative, you're going to come to me first. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're going to do is I'm going to I'm going to take your application. I'm going to look at it. Um, you can hand, you can email it to me. You can bring it in person. You can um, you can call me. Um, you can do it through the website, uh, but I'm going to get your application, and then I'm either going to call you or I'm going to email you. Um, if you bring it in person, we're just going to sit and talk. Um, I'm going to tell you about the company. I'm going to tell you a lot about the job, um, some of the ins and outs, um, the qualifications. I'm going to have you watch a little video. I have this awesome video. It's called Making a Difference Video. Um, and it's, it, every time I watch it, I just, I just go, oh, my goodness, the work that we do, um, helping people with developmental disabilities go in and connect and be part of their community. I'm going to have you watch a video. I'm going to give you information about the job. And then I'm going to have you do a little exercise. Mm -hmm. So because we do lots of reading. We do lots of writing. We make notes and stuff. We help people with their money management. So I need to know that you can read. I need to know that you can write. I need to know that you can, do, that you can balance a checkbook. Um, once that's good, I'm going to put you into an interview. Um, all this is going to happen the same day, hopefully. And then I'm going to start checking your references. And I think it was... Amanda was talking about the references. Uh, we do check references. Um, and that's kind of the stick that gets in the spoke sometimes. Um, and so, you know, if, if I'm working with you and I'm not getting your references back, I'm going to call you and say, shake a stick at so-and-so and help us get the references. Um, once, once your references are done, we, we offer you employment. We, you come in. And then we're going to give you some training. We have lots and lots of great training. Um, and, you know, for lack of a better term, I'm going to call it the 1163 training. A couple years ago, the state of Washington decided that everybody that does this kind of work needs training. Um, so we're going to bring you in and give you all the training that you need. Um, the last day of training, it's a squished version of fundamentals of caregiving. And what you're going to come out with is a nice, um, uh, I'm going to call it an endorsement for lack of a better term, that you can take that and go test for your long-term home care worker's license. Mm -hmm. And we're going to give you the training. We're going to pay you to come to the training, which is pretty awesome. Wow. And then you're going you're gonna to work. And you're going to get paid to train. You're going to get paid to work. Um, and then you're going to be one of us. Um, we have a nice benefits package. We have medical, dental, vision, prescription. We have an awesome um, leave package. So I've been with Service Alternatives for 23 years. I get six weeks of paid leave. I get a month and a half. Um, some companies give you sick time. Some companies give you vacation time. We're just going to give you paid time off. It's yours. You've earned it. You're adults. You can use it how you need to. Uh, let's see. I'm sure that I veered off a little bit. Uh, the name of the, um, the position we're hiring for is a DSP. It's called the Direct Service Professional. Um, some companies call it um, the Direct Support Professional. Um, and we work with adults um, with disabilities. We also work with children and families. We work with children who have developmental disabilities. We work with children who are in crisis, um, um, at-risk kids. Um, we bring them in um, to our services. We stabilize them for 30 days, and then we hope to find a, a less restrictive environment onto um, a foster home or, or a group home. On um, the starting wage, we're, we're human services work, and our, the, the, salaries, the, the hourly salaries that we pay is decided by the legislature of Washington State. So in King County, we pay, it starts at twelve fifty, and Tacoma. We have King County and Tacoma at twelve fifty, and then um, this area, Snohomish County, and um, up in Island County, it's twelve twenty-five. 
Um, we, we try, we really, really try and give our employees a raise after a year. We really, really try, um, depending on what the legislature lets us do. Um, but there's lots of room for advancement. So if you have, if you have the heart and the, um, the gumption and you roll up your sleeves and you do good work, the cream rises to the top. So if you're, if you're in this field and you're looking for advancement to become into management or leadership, Service Alternatives is a great company for that. Most of the people that are in leadership positions now have started right where y'all are. You know, I came in and worked, you know, as a direct, a direct service person. Um, the owners of the company have worked hands-on with the clients, and I think that's awesome. I think that's a really nice thing. Um, you know, a lot of companies don't do that any longer. You know, we want the people that work for us to, to rise up and grow with the company. Um, how help, helpful, tip, helpful hints. Um, Make sure your application is complete. So, you know, if, there, if there's a line there, you know, fill out the whole line, check all the boxes. You know, make sure that you put your phone number. I get lots of applications and there's not a phone number or there's not an email address. How to get a hold of people. So make sure it's complete. Um, let's see, uh, helpful hints. Uh, respond to phone calls and email messages. If I call you, call me back. You know, if I send you an email, email me back. Um, Interview tips, be yourself, smile, have fun with the interview. You know, we want to know about you. So be yourself, um, be on time, um, be well-groomed. I don't care if you wear jeans. Uh, I think jeans are fabulous. Um, if you come to work for us, you'll be wearing jeans uh, because you're, you know, you're helping people with, with personal care and stuff. Um, so, so wear what you want to wear. Um, and like I said, smile and be yourself. And let me think, what did I forget? How come you didn't wear jeans today, right? <laughs> because I wanted to look nice for y'all. <laughs> I almost did. I think. Oh, and um, we have a, a vision mission statement. So the, the vision and the mission statement for Service Alternatives is advancing the potential of our customers, communities, and ourselves through exceptional service. And we have six company core values, and we're really, really a value-based company. Um, the values are integrity. I look for people with with big amounts of integrity. Um, employee satisfaction. We, if you come to work for us, we want you to be happy. We want you to love your job. Um, excellence. You know, we really, really strive to provide exceptional services. Um, customer service. You know, the, the, the excellence and the customer service work together. Our customers, our clients. Um, our customers are also the people that pay our bills. You know, we, um, all of the people that we support come to us from the county and the state. So those are our customers. We want to make those people happy too. Um, fiscal responsibility. We are a for-profit company, um, and I've worked for for-profit companies, and I've worked for non-profit companies, and Service Alternatives um, really knows the value of the dollar, and they run more efficiently than a lot of these non-profit companies that I've worked for. And I find that, I find that, I like it, and I find it interesting. And then the last company core value is the community. We want to be part of the community. We started in, in Coopville, um, on with the island. You know, we started um, with six people. Um, and we want to be part of the community. All of the place, the people that, that work for us, we live in our communities. So we're part of your community, and we want to give back to the community. We go, we have cancer walks, we have, um, um, we, we, yes, that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we give back to the community. So I think, I think that that's all I need to say. Thank Thanks, you. Mary. At South Point Assisted Living. Um, unlike uh, some of the other ones that have spoken, we're a very small community. We only have 37 apartments and five cottages. So it's a smaller um, assisted living community. Uh, we're also part of a smaller home office. It's Radiant Senior Living. They only have 18 communities, three of which are in Washington. I've had the opportunity to be in all three buildings. And I can say that each of the building's culture is the same as the home office as far as teamwork um, and looking at our team for answers, um, not just going around making all these big decisions without looking at the people that are actually out there doing the care and working with the residents to find out if that decision is appropriate or not. So I always feel very confident when my boss calls me to say, yeah, this is what I think we need to be doing here. Or, no, I don't think that's going to work and this is why. And I want my team to be able to look at me and do those same things and say, hey, 
this isn't going to work because so-and-so is going to have a fit because she likes it done this way. So we're not going to change that. And I'm going to respect that opinion because I know you would know because you're out there doing that work. Um, so it's a wonderful team culture all the way, all throughout Radiant communities and particularly South Points. Uh, the other thing that uh, Radiant does is hire from within. Uh, we make our med techs, our RCCs, if it's appropriate. I've seen the RCC grow into, actually right now, they just got promoted to regional operations. So they're running a bunch of communities. Um, it's wonderful. I started out um, as business office manager and worked my way up into this position. Uh, some of the other things, I think the services part's been covered. We do activities of daily living. Uh, we hire CNAs, HCAs. Um, and we do have a training program if someone comes in with the right heart and the right confidence to be able to fill that position well. Uh, we have, we have an, an RN that's there 24 hours a week and we work under her license. Um, as far as salaries go, uh, if someone who comes in with absolutely no experience is probably going to start around 12. We do negotiate. I like to see the interview process. It's kind of like a first date. Um, you got to get to know me just as well as I get to know you, and then we decide if we're going to get married. So it's a really scary process, and it happens really fast. Um, in, before we make that proposal, though, we do like to check your references, and I agree with everybody else that that can be a difficult process if you guys don't call them and say, hey, I'm looking for a job. They're going to call you, and I'd really appreciate it if you would answer that call or call them back. Take them out to dinner, whatever it takes, because you can't get the job without the work. Um, you do want to show up for us professionally. You do want to be confident in who you are. Shake my hand because you are just as important as I am. You're making a decision too. Have that confidence about you. It's important. Um, benefits. We do have paid time off and you're actually eligible to take it for sick leave after 90 days. We don't just give a big pot of PTO. How that works is for every hour you work, you're accumulating PTO. So if you don't take any of your paid time off, at the end of your first year, you're gonna have 40 hours accumulated that you can use over the next year. Um, after, two, after two years, it's 80 hours. After six years, it's 120 hours. And so you can just use that however you want. Um, we do have paid bereavement of three days, so if someone close to you passes away, we would pay you while you go take care of that grieving process. Uh, we also have an, an excellent EAP program, which is an employee assistance program. So you can call them if, let's say one of our residents passes and you were very close to them. I might look at you and say, okay, it looks like you're having a hard time with this. It's really affecting you. Why don't you give them a call? And they're going to give you some free grief counseling. Um, they also do a lot of other things and have a website that's amazing for self-growth opportunities and different um, resources for you. Uh, we have 401k, dental, medical vision. We do have holidays that are recognized. If you start out as a line staff member, those holidays are time and a half if you work them. If you are part of the leadership team, those are paid days off. Um, we also offer free CEUs. So when you get your HCA or your CNA, you're required to have 12 CEUs every year to be able to renew that license. Um, our company actually requires you to do two CEUs every month, they're free, we'll pay you to do them. We want you to keep your license in good standing. Um, I think I think that covers it. Thank you. So I'm from Swedish. Um, we have five campuses in the area. So we have our two downtown Seattle locations. We have three community-sized hospitals within Ballard, Issaquah, and Edmonds. We also have two freestanding EDs in Mill Creek and Redmond as well. Um, we hire all across the board in our hospitals, so RNs, um, NACs, we've got techs, uh, ED techs, monitor techs, uh, perioperative support. Um, our MAs, we hire within our clinics, which we have numerous clinics in the area as well. Um, we also hire uh, patient services representatives within the hospital and our clinics as well. Um, benefits start day one. So we've got medical, dental, vision, retirement. We also have, um, you know, we have a supportive education with the culture within our uh, uh, within Swedish. Um, so we do have tuition reimbursement as well. 
Um, a majority of our clinical positions are within the union. So we are in the SEIU 1199 Northwest Union. Um, salaries range between around 18, 19, and it depends on your experience as well. Um, in addition to the required Washington license, um, all of our clinical uh, positions require basic life support as well. Um, interview process, uh, so it starts out, application submitted to Swedish.jobs. Um, potentially two interviews, uh, starts with a HR interview with the recruiter, so either in person or over the phone. Uh, moving forward, it gets to the manager and the team, and we put you through to orientation. Yeah, so Swedish stuff jobs. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Debbie Keithley. Um, I'm an RN, also a clinical recruiter. And when um, Jesse approached uh, a group of us, we were in Renton, and it's just like any situation that you guys deal with. Here's, here's what's going on. What do we do about it? And everyone just started playing with their schedule because we actually have another career event going on. So um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, the key is I want to focus on what's important to you. Uh, most of you, does everyone know that Kaiser's in Washington now? Yes. Kaiser's in Washington? No. That's okay. Oh, you do. Is there anybody that doesn't know that Kaiser's in Washington? Okay. Um, no, that's okay. But yeah, not a problem at all. Um, and most people aren't, depending on what areas you've been in. Kaiser is actually um, almost a nationwide um, healthcare organization. Most people know Kaiser if they moved from California. Yes, and um, they have ambulatory hospitals. Uh, Kaiser wanted to move into the Washington market, so what they did is they took a look at the different organizations out there, looked at a model that was very similar to what their model is and their philosophy, and they purchased Group Health. Uh, so we're here to stay, we're not going anywhere, and we're just going to grow and actually um, growing as quickly as we can. Uh, we focus on ambulatory care, and what that means is mainly clinics, um, outpatient surgery. We just opened an eight-bed um, inpatient med surge department, and that's on Capitol Hill. It's mainly for our patients that are in the PACU recovery room and in the urgent care. And you know how when you have those patients and everything looks okay, but you think, oh, I think we should watch over them just a little bit more? Well, that's what we're using this unit for. Um, and it works better because that way we don't have to transfer a patient to, um, to one of our partner hospitals. So we're hiring anywhere from medical assistants to nursing assistants to surge techs to patient care techs, um, phlebotomists. Um, pharmacy tax, LPNs, RNs, and we're all the way from Olympia all the way up to Everett. And we um, anticipate opening a number of um, additional clinics next year. Uh, the biggest thing is um, when you're looking at a job, and this is just a personal perspective, is I want you to think of yourself as a business. And you're really the product, so it's kind of like benefits and features. And sometimes we don't give ourselves credit for everything that we bring to the position. So when you apply, what I'd like all of you to do is put together a resume. And it doesn't have to be anything fluffy. I don't care about fluff, okay? What I want to know is, um, is what differentiates you. So how many of you have a healthcare background? Okay. How many of you have a customer um, background? Bingo. And really, that's what it's about, is not only are we taking care of the um, healthcare needs of patients, because that's expected, but we also want to wrap our arms around and make it an experience that comforts them. Because we typically aren't seeing them at their best. They're scared. They're hurt. Um, they don't know what's going to happen. They're frightened. And they want to be able to reach out to someone. So it's being able to, to know that, that you can do that. So when you're putting your resume together, put those things on there. You were a barista. You know, if you worked at 7-Eleven customer service, I can't think of any um, situations where um, you can't take what you've done and apply it. 
but put that on there because it's part of you. What typically happens is you apply, we've got a whole team of recruiters and growing, um, they'll review the application, look to see if you meet the um, minimum requirements, and then typically you're gonna get a phone call. And for MAs, you'll probably be getting a phone call from a gentleman by the name of Keith Russell. And that phone call is important, it's just a short phone call. Um, you know, when, when we're looking at interviewing, it's not about asking a lot of intelligent questions and getting intelligent answers. It's like finding out who you are. So, what's your energy? You know, um, what's your initiative? What are you passionate about? What gets you really, really excited? Uh, and, um, and graciousness. You know, all, um, we all run out of hours in a day. How many of you get phone calls and you're not able to return all the phone calls you get in one day? Okay, I'm really doing something wrong in here. <laughs> well, sometimes I just run out of hours in the day. So what I always ask people is, you know, is be gracious, have that understanding. The same way that I would if I reach out to you and you didn't call me back, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt because you've got lives, you've got your family, you've got your children, you may already be working a part-time job. So it's just extending yourself. We really, really believe that the key is treating each other the way that we want to treat our patients. Um, I heard one, what, what, had a conversation with one young lady and she was a little bit edgy, um, wanted to argue on the phone. Let's see, I can keep going on and on. And so we started talking about, tell me about your experience in, in dealing with the patient. And what she talked about, she goes, you know, I know I'm a little edgy and I'm a little rough on the edges, but I'm so nice with patients. Well, basically, the way you are to each other is really the way you're going to be with patients. So let that come out. You know, it's like, let us see your personality from that perspective. Um, when we do references, we use a company called Chexter. So what you do, you actually give us a list of references, and a survey is sent out to them. And they respond, and it's um, confidential, and it's an aggregate of all the results that they put in. So people really actually give us great information. Now, bottom line is, we never write anybody's name on there that's going to say anything about bad about us. I mean, that's just a part of, of references. So if somebody does say something bad, then that probably wasn't a good decision in putting their name down. But you want people that know you. They know your work. Um, they know what's important to you. Um, when you're applying. Have a reason why you want that position. Um, and do you apply for more than one position? You can. There's a balance between applying for what you want. Because I know what it's like. It's like, okay, I really want this job for all these reasons, but I really need to get my foot in the door. So when someone talks to you about the position that you've applied for, have a reason. Have, have that connection. Um, and because people want to hire people that want, um, want to work for you. So that's, that's a big piece that you're going to see. After that, uh, the information, the quick summary is passed on to a manager and then we make a decision. Uh, they'll bring you in for an interview. We try to move quickly, as, as quickly as we can. It's not about having 10 people and then we're gonna choose because sometimes it's just the right fit. Um, and I like the dating metaphor. Um, you know, one thing when you're interviewing, make sure you wanna work for them. It's like, just because somebody asks you out doesn't mean you have to say yes, okay? <laughs> you get to choose. And that's, that's what's important from that perspective. But it's the same way from the management's perspective is, um, do you want to date someone that wants to date you? Or, you know, I'm just kind of looking for anybody out there. Um, <laughs> so, again, have that reason that you connect with. And we're available for questions, answers. We've got a whole team of people. and. Uh, Oh, thank, thank you, you so time. much. This is your opportunity to mm -hmm. ask questions. So, so Christy? I have a lot of questions for specific folks, but um, since you just spoke last, and I, I, forgive me, I didn't hear your name. Oh, my name is Debbie. So if you think of Debbie Hi, Reynolds, who's really old, I think everybody <laughs> born in my year. <laughs> Hello, Neil. Right. Are you calling me? Hi, Debbie. <laughs> so you use the word aggregate. Can you say a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, and the aggregate is, if I sent all of you guys a survey um, to tell me about um, your program and what you liked about it and what you didn't like, when we get the survey back, it doesn't say, what's your first name? 
I'm Christy. Okay, it doesn't say Christy says this. It takes all of the information and it combines it. And uh, it just makes it much more confidential. You want to ask one more and then we'll have a couple more and we can come back to you, Christy? Um, yeah. So I have a question for um, Linnell. So that's okay. I have questions for a lot of folks. Um, so you mentioned that you work with adults, children, and young adults. Um, so I'm wondering, do you work with, um, when you say adults, do you mean all, everyone who's over 18? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then um, the second thing, that one of the things you said was, um, dress for business professional. Mm -hmm. So I've heard business casual, and I don't know what the difference is between business professional and business casual. So can you tell me a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so it sometimes depends on the organization. For our organization, business professional or business casual um, would not include wearing jeans with a blazer, maybe, or jeans with a sweater. Um, jeans wouldn't be appropriate, even if they're more fashionable jeans. Um, but it would be more, you know, for gentlemen, it'd be some, not necessarily a tie, but at least a button-up um, shirt with a collar on it. Um, for women, it may be slacks, a sweater, um, you know, something that looks more, not like you're going out with friends necessarily, uh, but something more dressier than your casual wear. Does that make sense? Other questions? Yeah. Um, so I have a question for <clears throat> Justin. You mentioned you were on a job shadow. I was wondering how you got to do that. Yeah, so that was in the eighth grade, so that was a while ago that was through my school. <laughs> but one thing that we do in our hiring process is we do a job preview. So anytime somebody comes and does a, uh, that wants to apply for a position, we typically say, okay, sign a piece of paper here that says you understand you're not going to get paid. We're going to let you actually go shadow a CNA, a dishwasher, whoever it is that you're, the position that you want. And so that's very similar to the job shadowing. So you can actually find out if, if you want to work there as well. And right. you have to apply to be To do the shadow? job shadows, yes. yes. Okay. How many of you would allow such a thing in your organization? So many, right? So that's one of those things we talked about earlier that prepare you, get you ready to identify what you want to do and where you want to work. I, I wanted to point out something. We had how many nonprofits? How many for-profits? What do you think is the distinction there between a nonprofit and a for-profit? Do you all understand what the difference is? Yeah. Can somebody summarize? So a nonprofit is what? It's a community-based organization whose profits go back into supporting the organization and developing it and building it. A for-profit has owners, and they benefit from the revenues that come in, and they oftentimes get dispersed through dividends or through some sure. other mechanism to give back the money to the people who, uh, who put their money into that organization. So they, too, use some of their money for development purposes and so forth, but it's very different. So does any, go ahead. I would say too with um, CHC in particular, um, nonprofit work, we um, actually receive federal grants um, from obviously the federal government to provide certain services as well to um, patients. Um, so, and we get donations that we have to target to very specific types of programs. So a nonprofit gets grants mm -hmm. and does fundraising, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Do the for-profits do that? No, no. So nonprofits are grant, they get grants, so they might hire specialty kinds of things that they're gonna do, so very different. Yeah. What I just want to add, um, I mean, the nonprofit um, designation is a, a tax designation, so we, nonprofits receive a, a tax benefit because they provide some community benefit to the population. So we have to demonstrate community benefit, and that might be um, taking care of individuals who, uh, who might not have insurance or um, might have other, um, uh, dis might be coming from disadvantaged backgrounds or um, at-risk populations. We also do a lot in the community to support um, community events and you know, um, uh, health fairs and that kind of thing. So um, nonprofit organizations tend to do a little bit more of that because that's a condition of the patient and their tax status. Yeah, go ahead. I would say one thing from the perspective of a for-profit employer, uh, just clarifying that that doesn't mean our North
North Star is making money. Our first core value is taking care of our patients. Our second core value is being an enriching and supportive workplace and being a place where people want to come to work. Um, so just because you have the tax designation um, of being a for-profit organization does not mean that dollars and cents are the primary driving force of everything. So I would just clarify yeah. that as well. Yeah, and I would just, I would add to that that being not profit doesn't mean that you're not also focused on right. There's erroneous sort of concept that yeah. if you're nonprofit yeah. you don't want to make money and, and of course you want to make money. <laughs> Adult family homes, they're all privately owned, right? We have for profit and we have non profit. Okay. But what I do find in adult family homes is most of them run for profit as an <laughs> As a nonprofit, in the sense of most of their profits go back out into the economy of workers' wages, benefits, and needs of the clients. Great. So let me ask you another question. You talked about uh, dealing with uninsured individuals. Mm -hmm. how, did, how did the rest of you, like the clinics, handle when someone comes and they don't have insurance? So at CHC, we actually have patient eligibility and enrollment specialists, which is another position I recruit for. Um, and they will actually meet with anybody who wants to come in who doesn't have insurance um, and actually try and find insurance for them or services that will help them pay for the um, whatever service they're trying to get. If they are not qualified for anything, we'll still provide the service to them. Um, but we'll also help them find food stamps, housing, um, really anything that's for the basic care of themselves and their family. Um, we'll help them. Very different organization than what you're going to see in others. And by the way, I personally thank you because for, for 30 years I've been bringing clients to your organization who have been uninsured. And without you, I don't know what I would have done. But Justin, you wanted to speak to that? Yeah, and so in the assist, assisted living um, industry, it's not typically an emergency group, right? People are at home. They've maybe planned to this move, even though maybe it's just a week. And so it's not, and then we don't bill insurance. So most of the time it's private pay. There are eight um, assisted livings, I believe eight in Snohomish County, and then a lot of the adult family homes that accept Medicaid. So that's that process of getting on Medicaid <coughs> and then finding a place that will accept them um, for, uh, if they don't have the funds to private pay. Anybody else want to speak to that? Other questions? Go ahead. Look, I have a question for Javel. You talked about growth development as an employee. So do you have to be in a good standing or have to work for the company for certain for a certain period to be able to get those benefits? You talk so, about benefits to from from within? Yeah. So like if you want to further your education and as a student as well, I know this place safe will work. So how many, um, what's the range between the, the time range between these clinics? Do you have to walk like three hours? Um, for, so if I get your question, so we can, you can work as low as four hours a week, up to 40 hours a week. And I know you're talking about like promotions from within. So if I hire you as a CNA and you're amazing, I, I might offer you a position in the office, you know, in the first month. Okay. So, but I'm not a question like if you need to go back to school. So we'll work with your schedule. So we, we just hired somebody in our office to be a care coordinator, mm -hmm. and she needs to get her CNA license, and so we're actually helping to pay for it, and I'm totally working around her schedule okay. to have her be able to get this um, certification that she needs. So we'll work with you as much as we can. You had a question? Go ahead. Uh, yeah. So kind of just not directed towards anybody. I have a few um, questions for whoever would like to answer. Um, Often in interviews, I hear, tell me about yourself. What do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Great question. Go ahead. Um, I'll give you an answer. Just from being on both sides of the fence, is everybody has a story. And it's nice if you create your story. Think about who you are. And because part of interviewing, it's really, really easy when you're interviewing. Um, to connect, but that connection might take you talking about dogs, you know, or horses, or kids. So you want to have your story about um, what you want, why you're there, what you bring. So you can always weave that back in, because there's nothing worse than having an interview, 
you walk out and you think, darn, I wish I would have shared this with them. So in your story, think about um, something you feel really good about, an achievement. And always weave that in again with your business, where you're going, you know, what the foundation you're going to build, and what direction are you thinking you want to go. Because that gives um, employers then the opportunity to say, it's like a career path. Because our life is a path, and sometimes we know where we're going. Otherwise, you can't get there. But you might have little detours, like you might have a promotion that comes up that you never thought about because somebody saw a certain skill or attribute in you. Um, so think, yeah, think of it that way. I mean, I could sit here like in five seconds and tell people someone about me. You know. Um, Thank you. Others, go ahead, Amanda. I kind of break that into kind of bookend questions where I start every interview with. Uh, how did you get started in this field? What prompted your interest in this type of position? And so getting kind of the, the backstory of why are you passionate about this? What what brought you to the point where you decided to go to MA school or nursing school or whatever the type of position is? Um, something about you that, that makes you the best person for you. You're applying for a caregiver position by sharing a story like, oh, I used to take care of my grandmother and I love doing X, Y, and Z. That's your, you're going to definitely bond with me and I'm going to think you're very passionate and want to take care of clients. You can talk about your personal values, things that you value. Do you value your, your family? Do you value um, time? What is it that, that makes you tick? All right. Any other questions? Do you have more? I do. Oh, my God. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, how quickly uh, do, from the interview process, do you normally want employees, potential employees to start? For, for, for us at least. 48 hours? Oh wow. Even if they're previous, like currently employed and just looking for a new job, would I you want. give them? You, that tells me that you're ready. Oh, okay. Yeah. We have, it, it, it all depends because in most, most times if you already have a position, you typically are required or professional courtesy of, of, of giving notice. notice. Yeah. So we support that because what you do for your current employer is what you're going to do for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it does take about two weeks to do all of the onboarding. Uh -huh. um, so different responses. Okay, yeah. So the middle. Middle. What, do you, what do you think? Everything in between. If there's somebody, yeah. you've got a job, and I want you, and I want you now, I'll say, okay, I'll wait two weeks, but okay. sign the job off the letter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <that's> yeah. Right. <laughs> I say quickly. I mean, like, we can start vetting you right away while you're still maybe Getting notice mm -hmm. to an employee. I mean, you know, everybody wants that courtesy, but you know, we got to move along too. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I think responding. I've had some people are like, "Oh, I'm not working, but I want to start in two weeks." It's like, well, you know, we, we want you to start now. Not, <laughs> oh, like, yeah. I want to take two weeks before I start a new job. You just want to, you want to move quickly. Yeah, but still give the notice. Okay. Any others? Hmm. I'd say we'd be more similar to how. Hi, so you have, you have an onboarding process that takes time to go through as far as immunization review and background check and drug screening and some of those types of things. And so, uh, and we have, then we have a, every other Monday is a start date possibility for us where we start groups of employees together for, for training and orientation. And so for us, it's generally um, two, three, four weeks out. And, and, and with that, we can work with you. If you have, if you're not working and, and we're able to get through some of those requirements more quickly, then we can start folks sooner. Uh, if you're the only medical assistant in a really small practice and you have loved working there and you don't want to leave them stranded without you, we'll work with you. If you need four weeks or five or six weeks um, in order to make sure that you've trained your replacement, we want to honor that and, and admire that you want to take care of the place where you've worked because, like she was saying, then we know that you'll do the same thing for us if you were to leave down the road. And so, um, so you usually can, can work with things like that. Yes, Jeff. Just, just real quick. So... In Washington, marijuana is legal, and so I know that that's one thing that's been an issue is, okay, do you pop positive for, for marijuana in your system because it stays a little bit longer? And so while you're doing the interview process, I would ask that. Know if you're going to test positive because you don't want to go give notice to your other job and then not get the job because of that drug test. But then also the background check. When you're filling out the DSHS background check, be honest. Because if you can talk with the employer immediately and say, yes, I did have these things on my criminal record, they can tell you, oh, more than likely this is not going to work out, or yes, this is going to work out. Because you don't want to give notice and then be like, oh, I didn't get the job and have to go back to your employer. Let's talk about so, this for a minute because yes. it's a biggie. How many of you drug test? 
What do you do if you pop dirty on marijuana? Is it an automatic? We rescind, and you can't. We rescind. Did you hear that? Okay. Same. Same for you. Same for us. Same for you. We actually just changed our policy, um, and mar marijuana is no longer taking up. We don't even test for it. You don't test. Yeah, we anymore. have cocaine on there. Another. How about you? I don't know the answer. You don't, okay. Mm -hmm. Mary, we don't test. You don't test at all. What you do on your own time is your own business unless you make it ours. Adult family homes in general, <laughs> don't test. Don't test. Pretty mm -hmm. random drug tests and random on suspicion. And if you get her dirty? I've never had a dirty, so <laughs> I will have to find that one out. <laughs> but I will say if you get injured in an adult family home, L and I normally will require that you test positive okay. because they won't want to pay for your injury. Right, so important. Many of you don't realize that most of these organizations are going to run a DSHS background check on you. How many are you doing? It? How many of you are? You are? Because you're licensed. DSHS background check, child abuse. If you've got a child abuse history, any complaints against you, it's going to show up. So it's a problem. Okay? So. I've got child abuse history. I've got what other kinds of things? Vulnerable adults. Vulnerable adults. Any vulnerable adults? Mm -hmm. How about theft? Because we're in home, theft is pretty much Theft is a no no. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. How about if I have a DUI? For us, that's only a problem if you're driving ever clean vehicles. Okay. So I so might we be able to. on a case by case basis and, and see what the situation was and what type of position. Justin? I was just going to say, with so the response that we get back from DSHS is there's a review required, right. meaning ah. that there's an issue and we have to review it with the applicant, or they say, no, you cannot hire. But that okay. could be an assault for, which could be domestic, so and that can be something that is forgiven. I have a worker that she was a victim of domestic violence, but when it first came to her, she was the one that was arrested. So I went down to the courts and I got her file. And she got flagged with a with a theft or with a domestic, not domestic, but she got flagged with an assault four. And it wasn't until the guy tried to take her life the second time around that he got in prison. But she has that on her background forever. But and you really took time. But I took time and right. went to the and courts I'm not and showed sure the red have that. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. Nice. Yeah. 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 How about over here, criminals? Um. <laughs> 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 Question. Christy, did you find any more? Yeah, so I actually had the, the marijuana question. Um, because <coughs> students ask me that, you know, can you tell me about that? And so that's nice that you asked. Um, I also, you, Angela, you used the word dividend. Can you, when you're talking about profit and nonprofit, could you clarify? Oh, we were just talking this? about, I was referring to when, when you go public you know, and you become a publicly funded corporation, they actually. They raise capital that way and they give dividends to the people who buy stock in their Shareholders. companies. Shareholders. So those dividends are checks that you get, usually at the end of the year, sometimes quarterly, depending on what kind of company. How many of you buy stocks? So you know, you get yeah. dividends. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I don't also want a time hog, so, because I have a big list. Anyone else? Oh, look at you. Go, Ken. Go. Okay. Um, who would you like to see on a reference list, and how many references would you like? I want to see your most current employers so that you're not hiding anything. And um, ideally, your last two to three. Okay. We require three references, and we prefer them to all be professional. I don't want to talk to your mom and your friends. Oh. Mm -hmm. And we require at least one manager or supervisor, and then either a coworker or someone we work on projects with, um, but for not friends or family. Yeah, we like to have one or two supervisors or managers, and then um, two, two colleagues. One thing that just recently has come up, and, and I was a bit shocked by, so I'll just share with you, is that when we do this um, survey, the company can actually identify the source of where that reference is coming from. So we've actually had two recent situations where um, the individual responding, they use the same cell phone for everything. So it's, um, it wound up being fraud, unfortunately. Oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I just, I just do any understand. of the others of you use companies to do your background? You yeah, do as well? Because right. that's really extensive, isn't it? And you'll get additional information, won't you, on those background checks, including, do you want to share with us what's included in those background checks? We get everything. You get, it. so this everything. is important for you to understand. <laughs> when she says everything, you're getting credit information, right? Mm -hmm. You're getting what else? Um, anything that's been put through the stage, um, multiple states, we're getting local information, misdemeanors, felonies. You got yeah. pulled over, we get your traffic tickets. Traffic. We don't yeah. get credit. Yeah, we don't and get it credit. goes back as far as your record. It doesn't yeah. stop at five years. It goes so all the way back. These, these things have long memories. Yeah. Long <laughs> memories. And sometimes you, you forget that there's stuff there that you can't even remember, and it comes up. I've had those kinds of calls, so... How many of you check social media? I do. <laughs> I had one person, they listed their boyfriend as a reference, and that's how I found out was from Facebook. Their boyfriend. But I called and got a reference. So. We do not. I did not hire them. Yeah, I got a question here. A little quiet voice. Go ahead. If someone at the DOT and the reception in the U.S. on the phone call, can they get the reference? Yeah. 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 So Ooh. What was the question? Quite no awkward. professional references. Volunteer. Have you volunteered? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and references people. from school are school, great. Yeah. Anybody mm -hmm. that you work with, advisors, instructors, different people like that are great references. Mm -hmm. We have a number of students. We have a number okay. of students in our program who are immigrants, as you can, as evidenced by the people in this room, and they struggle with trying to put together that story about themselves that's e equal or relevant in this country, and it's very difficult. So uh, I work often with some of you when I'm floating resumes with you to try and explain and introduce. Yeah. I would say talk. talk to us. There's always exceptions to things. And we ask for five references, but in some circumstances, maybe someone's worked in the same organization with the same manager for a really long time, and that's their, their primary only person. We'll talk to that person and, and can waive other requirements. Same thing, we haven't worked. We can be creative and problem solve together, figure out who we can talk to. All right, so we've got about 25 minutes, and I want to give you time to talk with them one on one, which is what this. So, why don't we take two more questions and then we'll well, go ahead? Been homeless, um, like, uh, uh, I don't know, been just away from the workforce for a while. And you just explain your time. Is that the best explain thing? Just, just explain it. That's part of that story we were sure. talking about sure. earlier, developing that personal story. Christy? I have a question because you said that you see credit information. We don't. Um, they don't, but they do. But but some of them are don't think. Credit. Mm -hmm. so, so my question is, if you do receive credit information about someone, um, is that information, I mean, I know that once you see it, you can't unsee it, right? Um, <laughs> and, and I think it's important to know if that's considered because if someone's been having had persistent poverty, it's really hard once you get out of that. I mean, it takes a really long time to repair credit. Um, so I'm wondering how you use that information. It's a good question. I will have to get back to our building manager and find out because that's something that they hold for their information. Yeah. It's mostly to, my understanding is to um, ensure that they can manage finances. So even with a low credit score, it's fine, but not necessarily something that so and that's some of the questions you want to ask. Before you decide to apply to these places, ask those questions. Call up and do an informational assessment. What kind of reference checking do you do? You know, ask those questions up front so you're prepared. Because if you get hit with that, you don't know. It's like, oh my gosh. All right, one more question and then we'll turn you loose. Go ahead. So I would call you back and ask, tell you, you know, we need you to call these references and beg them to call us back. One lady said, take them to lunch. I mean, it really is, we can't hire you if you, your references don't call us back. And so you really would have to call and, and beg. I, I've had to do it for past employers that are too busy. So help me out. I'm not going to get this job if you do not return this phone call. And if I get those kind of calls, I mean, you'll call them back. And I've had my own employees, you know, I've got so many calls per day, I really need you to return this call, I'm gonna stop and do it. So I think just reminding the employer, like, I need your help. Yeah. 
So some people are only three weeks before that. Yeah. Well, in some cases, it's a matter of their working hours. Maybe they're working during the day just like we are, so they can't call us back. So we'll actually get an email address also and send the same exact questions and have them respond to the email instead. So they can do it at 11 o'clock at night if they want. And if I've floated a resume for you, they'll call me and <laughs> say, get that reference for me. So, okay, so thank you all so much. Let's give them a big hand.